Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another lecture video. This is the second part of our two parts looking at a question of um, should torture be used as a method of gathering information from terrorist suspects or people convicted of terrorist offenses, at least in certain situations? And should that tactic be part of a legal existing legal framework or should it be something that is only done really outside of the existing legal framework the possibility of uh, successful actions being excused somehow after the fact so and and those are separate questions and they can be separable and if you look at the, the essay instructions on the topic i have separated them out into a couple of different topics uh, there's also a possibility if, you know, if you design your own essay question, if you sort of think about the issue and you say, I want to approach it in this way and it doesn't really neatly fit either of those ways, you contact me with the question that you want to uh, tackle. Uh, as, as long as you get advance approval by me, I'm open to a paper on really anything that's directly relevant to what we're looking at. So if you come up with your own subject matter, feel free to get in touch and you can design your own question to answer. So, Last time we were looking at um, our two films, so Unthinkable and Zero Dark Thirty, and then we we're also looking at Alan Dershowitz's piece on the subject. Today we are looking at Maureen Ramsey's piece, Can the Torture of Terrorist Suspects Be Justified? All right, there we go. Um, so 2006 piece, so um, within a few years of Dershowitz's piece, and of course about five years after uh, September 11th, uh, and then the ensuing wars of that time. So, uh, Ramsey is someone that I don't have a picture for, I just couldn't track it down. Uh, she was the senior lecturer in political theory at the School of Politics and International Studies at the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. Um, wrote on a number of different political subjects, including lying in politics, liberalism, uh, torture and its use. So, another interesting individual to study. Now, this piece, the torture of terrorist suspects be justified, We've broken it down again into three parts. Uh, she herself has a few different parts. Uh, overall, very well organized piece. I, I think it's, it's very nicely put together. You know, whether or not you think the arguments are convincing, I think she does a really good job, especially in the, the introduction in the piece, of really setting up what she wants to do and then telling you what it is she's going to be doing in the piece, and then she goes on to do it. Now that introduction is longer than what I want you to do for an introduction, in part because the piece itself is quite a bit longer than what you're doing, but it's a really nice example of somebody sitting down saying, okay, here's the subject matter, let me set this up for you. Now in the following sections, here are the things that are gonna happen, and where they're gonna happen. So in, uh, sort of early on in the paper, she, she reviews quite a bit of, of material, um, quite, Quite a few sources coming, you know, from the news and, and things from politics. Um, now, part of what we were looking at last time, of course, Dershowitz was writing a little bit earlier, uh, and so there's you, you've got to keep the time frame of events in mind here. So there's the September 11th attacks, and then fairly shortly thereafter, uh, you get the start of the war in Afghanistan, which uh, the, the Taliban was charge of Afghanistan, uh, basically allied with or, or you know, uh, aided and embedded Al-Qaeda. Uh, and so there was a, a widespread international effort to go into Afghanistan, including, of course, basically led by American forces, but also included Canadian forces and, and others. Uh, so there's that war. And then shortly thereafter, the uh, American forces also went into Iraq. And that was a war that was less widely supported. Uh, so, you know, the, the Americans went in, but it wasn't UN sanctioned. The British, uh, you know, played some role there. Um, I believe they did, but it, uh, it was much more of a, an American war. And of course, became sort of well known after the fact that a lot of, but, you know, the justification for going to war in Iraq, at least in part, was that they had weapons of mass destruction. There was intelligence suggesting that the Iraqis had weapons of mass destruction, that Saddam Hussein would use those and, and you know, support terrorism and so on. And so they went in, connected the war, uh, and then 
well, no weapons of mass destruction. And, and so there's this big question of why, why did America invade Iraq? Um, I'm not going to pretend to settle that. Right, but it's it's this sort of ongoing lingering question. There's a costly war, right? It was successful in the sense that they overthrew Hussein, uh, and also you know broke up the country. And you know Hussein was not a nice person. He, he was a dictator, right? He was um, quite terrible. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, but then of course there's there's a question there. Well, how much better or worse did things get after he, uh, you know, was was taken down? The regime was changed over. So we can set that aside, but just in terms of, of timelines, we've got 9-11, you know, war in Afghanistan, war in Iraq. And so by the time Ramsey is ready, you know, the war in Iraq has been conducted, um, basically. And so she's drawing on, in terms of events, not just what was going on, you know, directly in the aftermath of 9-11 with uh, what's going on in Afghanistan, but also drawing on events that were going on in Iraq, including at the... Uh, prison of Abu Ghraib, uh, which is a fairly notorious prison fair. Uh, so we're, we're going to hear some of that from Ramsey. Here, here's some of this historical context. I'm, I'm going to give very, uh, just very high level overview of it. I'm not going to encapsulate everything that she talks about, which is why it's worth reading the piece. Uh, but then from setting the scene of, of what the facts are, right? What, what's actually happening on the ground in terms of the use of torture, Ramsey wants to turn to the academic debate. Uh, and first she wants to examine consequentialist approaches to the use of torture. So like Dershowitz, right? Dershowitz provides a consequentialist argument along the lines of what Jeremy Bentham would, would provide. Uh, consequentialism is really uh, um, a school or family of moral theories that believe the moral uh, worth of an action, you know, whether or not it's, it's right or wrong to do, lies in the consequences or results of the action. So Ramsey is going to examine these sorts of arguments and ultimately argue that uh, consequentialist approaches in favor of torture, such as Dershowitz's, but she also examines a, a number of others that she actually uh, takes on more squarely, really just don't stand up to scrutiny. That the consequential, consequentialist cases themselves aren't actually going to work the way people like Dershowitz want them to. Lastly, Ramsey uh, argues that, you know, it's, it, we shouldn't even be using a consequentialist approach to this issue at all. Instead, we should endorse the use of absolute moral principles, ones that don't allow for this kind of flexibility, depending on what the consequences are. So she argues that torture is inherently wrong, uh, that we need to reaffirm the absolute prohibition on torture, and then offers a, a potential explanation for why torture is used. Then in fact, it's not as a means of information gathering, but it's actually uh, indicative of a different kind of attitude. And, and it's meant to serve a different purpose. So we'll see what she has to say about that. So first, what's, what's going on in the world that Ramsey has to tell us about? Well, she outlines, and like I said, I'm not going to go through this sort of blow by blow, so I've given you a very sort of big picture, um, you know, history of, of just sort of what happened there, 9-11, right? war in Afghanistan, uh, war in Iraq, uh, you know, uh, under the umbrella of the sort of war on terror that's going on in the, the early, right, you know, throughout the 2000s, uh, and Zero Dark Thirty is very much set in that. So Unthinkable is set in the aftermath. Well, okay, you know, at some point after 9-11, but of course that, the, the very plot, you know, the ticking bomb terrorist um, is something that became very sort of salient in, you know, American, Canadian, maybe just American culture after 9-11, uh, you know, and especially in the, the decade following. Uh, and Zero Dark Thirty, I think does a very nice job of, of sort of tracing the fallout. So, you know, it really starts with some of these, uh, you know, haunting calls and, and recordings from 9-11 itself, and then moves into looking at the actions of CIA operatives overseas in the, the following years, right? And, and it cuts across a number of years. So with, and the, the film itself comes out, I think it's 2012 off the top of my head. So, you know, here we are, so we're 11 years after 9-11 there. And, now here we are, you know, 19, 
19 years later. Um, and so in some sense, some of these issues have, have gone onto the back burner a little bit, right? Uh, but also not really, you know, it's, it's, there are still troops over there. And of course they're just talking, about, okay, well, are we just gonna, well, okay, not we, right? Uh, but you know, are American troops, you know, just gonna leave or, or what's gonna go on? What's, what's gonna happen in that whole area of the world after, you know, decades of intervention and, and disruption and money flowing in one way or another, um, right? They're, they're good questions. But there's still this, this issue here because this was something, this you know, question about the use of torture and everything uh, through the, the Bush administration. Like that was really when this all flared up and was controversial. Then during the Obama administration, and you see this in Zero Dark 30, he, yeah, well, Obama's on uh, television at, at one point talking about, you know, we're not going to torture anymore. We have to regain our moral standing for the world. Um, <clears throat> and then with President Trump coming in, I, I can recall, I didn't sort of dig it up to um, see exactly when he, he made the remarks, but um, at least maybe it was as a candidate or maybe early in his presidency, I don't quite remember, uh, talked about right, you know, sort of enthusiastically endorsing uh, the use of torture if it meant getting information and, and saving American lives. So um, this is still this is still an issue, right? This is still a live question for, for us, for the world. So let's see what Ramsey's got to tell us. Now, in outlining the US government policy really leading up to the revelations of abuse at uh, Abu Ghraib, but, and Abu Ghraib was already a, a prison used by Saddam Hussein. Um, so it's, I, I don't know if it should be ironic or, or what, uh, but here's this prison that was used basically as a political prison to lock people up and torture them and execute them uh, under the dictator. And then once the dictator's overthrown, then you know the forces of freedom have shown up to liberate everybody. Well, what is it? It's still a you know prison used to torture people. Uh, it's just presumably different people being tortured in. So the shifts that are going on there. So some of, of what's going on here, I talked about when I was talking about um, unthinkable the other day as well. Uh, some of the shifts include redesignating what the enemy combatants were. So, you know, there's this, there's this war on terror. Well, in a war, there are various sorts of international conventions, such as the Geneva Convention and, and uh, UN conventions and so on, about how prisoners of war should be treated. Well, they, the, the fighters, terrorist fighters, right? Um, there are these questions about, okay, what, what do we call different people, right? Terrorist fighters, are they enemy troops, right? Are they captured? you know, prisoners of war, right? If it's a war on terror, doesn't that mean that enemy fighters are, are now soldiers? Well, no, and this, there's this big, uh, you know, uh, deal, is with all this noise about this. Uh, no, they're unlawful combatants, right? They're illegally taking part in conflict. So they don't actually fall under, say, the Geneva Convention or whatever. And you get this in Unthinkable, where uh, Brody says, you know, look, um, we can't be torturing younger, right? We can't, we can't be torturing Yusuf. He's an American citizen, which means he has certain rights, which means, you know, we, like, we can't do this to him. And the response is, oh, no, he doesn't, right? <laughs> His citizenship was revoked yesterday, right? He's stateless. He's just, he's in legal limbo. He can't invoke habeas corpus. He can't bring a, a case, you know, to trial. Uh, he, he can't be represented by the legal system, basically. All right, he's now a nobody, in effect. Uh, so there's the, the whole, I'm going to call it a game, which of course we're talking here about people's lives and people being brutally tortured for, you know, significant amounts of time uh, and held in terrible conditions with no right to counsel or representation or anything like that. So, you know, I, I don't mean to trivialize what we're talking about by calling it a game, but there is this sort of legal political game in terms of, of shuffling around who fits into what category, right? Are these prisoners of war? Oh no, they're unlawful combatants, which means they, you know, anything designed to protect prisoners of war doesn't apply to them, right? Um, torture, right? Oh, torture is a bad thing. So what counts as torture exactly? Right? And this is something else Ramsey talks about, that uh, torture was redefined sort of unilaterally within American policy 
uh, to only include really like the most extreme measures that would you <laughs> basically if it wasn't uh, if the person being uh, what I, I want to use the word tortured um, you know not to not to beg the question on the person being interrogated unless they basically felt like they were dying or had organ failure or something well it no longer counted as torture. So, you know, a little bit of light waterboarding or keeping them up for days at a time, um, hanging them upside down, applying pressure points, beatings, you know, extreme hot and cold, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Oh, well, all of a sudden, that's not torture. That's uh, enhanced interrogation techniques, I believe, was the euphemism used at the time. Um, right? And this is the thing. It was, and we see this in uh, Unthinkable. So graphic content warning. Um, something we see with Younger is that his fingernails get pulled out. And Dershowitz talks about inserting a, a sterilized needle under fingernails as a way of, of torture, right? Something that's not gonna you know, produce lasting damage likely, but sticking that needle under fingernails as a way of producing extreme pain and discomfort. Right? Um, is pulling out somebody's fingernails torture, right? I think most of us would just say, yeah, right? But if it's not, I'm, you know, what, what would be? Uh, but is it necessarily, right? When we're thinking in terms of law, we're thinking in terms of policies, there are decisions made about what counts as torture. It's taking somebody and locking them in a cell torture. In some sense, I wanna say yes, but that's just how the prison system works. You take somebody and lock them up. Does that mean anybody who's, who's locked up for any reason is now being tortured? Probably not, or maybe not. I think our intuitions would be a little less unified around that. Um, so, you know, what what counts as torture, right? There's the sort of, I'll, I'll pose it, you know, philosophical question, what essentially is torture? What What is torture really? And Ramsey talks about a UN definition of it, which is useful, you know, worth, worth consulting and taking a look at there. Uh, and that might be something if you're writing paper on this subject, you could say, take that UN definition and say, okay, look, I'm just going to assume for the purposes of my argument here that this UN definition of torture really accurately defines what it is. But when it comes to setting policies and, and laws and thinking about accountability, there is this kind of, as I called it, game, right? Oh, this, you know, uh, pulling out fingernails isn't really torture. It's actually an enhanced interrogation technique. And don't worry, they aren't prisoners of war who are protected against torture. They're unlawful combatants who actually don't have any legal protection, so don't worry about it. Okay. The, effectively, this is what was going on. Right? Now, Ramsey herself, so she covers a lot more ground. She goes into a lot more detail. She cites a lot of sources, so really great work. It's worth consulting her footnotes as well. Uh, in going through, because she's really tracing the evolution of U.S. Uh, the, the use of torture as a part of U.S. foreign policy through Afghanistan, where many terrorists were captured, into Iraq, where, as she notes, or at least asserts based on the information she has, that in fact, many, if not most of the prisoners they had were not terrorists. They were you know, members of the Iraqi military um, or you know, other people. There was a, there's a note in there somewhere that something like over... 80 or 90 percent of the, the prisoners that you know were in U.S. custody in Iraq really probably weren't supposed to be there. They were arrested by mistake or something like that. Again, worth consulting what her actual numbers were, but it was it's a surprisingly high figure. Um, so in tracing this, seeing how torture is being used in Afghanistan against terrorists and then how it sort of those tactics, you know, are carried over into Iraq into a different war against a different enemy um, and against different detainees, ultimately Ramsey asserts that really what was going on at, at Grab as well as sorry, in general, were the product of a morally degraded climate created by the institutional approval of the US government for overriding international prohibition on the treatment of enemy combatants. So really what, what are we seeing or what were we seeing you know, over that evolution of US foreign policy? Well. What was going on at Abu Ghraib weren't just you know, a few rogue elements, a few um, sort of sadistic US soldiers doing things that they shouldn't have been doing when, as they tortured prisoners. 
But instead, what we saw is really the natural result of an entire structure, right? A, a whole institutional structure that approved of torture at various sorts of levels. And then ultimately, what, what happens? Well, just think about it in terms of zero dark 30. What they did was catch a few people with the dog collars. Uh, and, and that's who got in trouble, right? It was some enlisted soldiers, low ranking soldiers, the people who were actually doing it, right? Were they ordered to do it? Maybe yes, maybe no. And this is where I think unthinkable as well as Zero Dark Thirty come in handy, right? Who's actually explicitly being ordered to, you know, torture and unthinkable? Uh, not really anybody. It's, it's, you know, we really, really need this information. And, uh, you know, any, anything we can do to get it is, is uh, uh, fine. We're not telling you to torture H, but, um, you know, anything you can do to get it is, uh, is fine for, on the highest levels. Of course, you know, off the books, sort of back channel. It's, you know, there, there's not going to be, a, you know, the president's not going to go on television and say, well, you know, we've got this terrorist, and su uh, terrorist suspect in custody, and we are going to torture the hell out of them uh, and see what happens. Right? No, it's, it's not that. It's all secret. Right? So Ramsey, in tracing what's going on here, really wants to fight against the narrative that says it's, it's just a few you know, rogue elements who are engaged in torture. It's, it's just a, a few sadistic soldiers that will be punished and so on. No, it's really an entire climate of, of accepting torture that's been produced by U.S. policy leading up to that point. And it's become very widespread. And in Zero Dark Thirty, right, this, we, we see some of this when Maya is trying to, um, you know, some, some of the information she's gotten out of the, some of the torture sessions um, or interrogation sessions, right? Here again, the, the shell game, right? Was it a torture session? Oh, no, it was just an interrogation session. We're trying to get information by, you know, waterboarding and playing the loud music and the dog collar and the box and all, you know, all that stuff. But you know, it's it's really interrogation. You know, what kind of session it was? How do you define it? By the actions that were taken, or by the purpose for which they were taken? Right? The results, desired results. So, um, anyway, Maya has information, right? But she's not sure if it's accurate. So she goes through other interviews to try to check that information, cross reference, right? See if she can confirm or or uh, um, falsify it by seeing what other people in other sessions have said. And in that, she's got right, mounds and mounds of, of interviews and videos and, and sessions like this uh, to go through. So it's not just you know, one or two or you know, the odd case where torture is being used to gather information. It's this widespread practice. And of course, in Zero Dark Thirty and feeling reality, um, from what we know, assuming the events of Zero Dark Thirty are at least roughly accurate, uh, those efforts resulted in the assassination of Osama bin Laden, right? Even if we assume, which you, you might want to argue against, but if we assume it was a good thing that he, you know, eventually uh, was, was killed, right? Uh, does that justify that widespread use of torture? Assuming we're willing to count the activities as torture. Right? What if he wasn't? assassinated? What if they never found it where he was? Right? What if for all that torture, all they got was, you know, information that was helpful, but, you know, never directly stopped a terrorist attack, never actually led to high-ranking uh, other people. In fact, at one point in, in uh, Zero Dark Thirty, there's this, this meeting, uh, it's, you know, partway through the film, um, there's this meeting where, where basically it's, you know, all the CIA people who are, are working on What's going on? You know, tracking down the uh, um, Al Qaeda and tracking down Bin Laden and all this stuff, uh, right? So, so all of them are in the room. And they all get chewed out by the. Can't think of exactly what uh, uh, title he had or that kind of thing. You know, we, like we've got nothing. There's nobody on you know another floor. There's not another room. There's not some other working group on this. It's just us, and and we're screwing up, right? For all our torture. We don't really have any information. We don't have any targets. We don't have anybody to like bomb or kill, right? We're not really getting anywhere. So, you know, work harder, get me some results. So for all that torturing, what'd they get? At that point, right, assuming something like that happened, not much. So there are, this 
is what really leads us to um, this, this debate, this academic debate that Ramsey wants to look at, All right? Uh, what, if anything, could justify the use of torture against terrorist suspects is the way she puts it. And so there's another interesting thing to keep in mind here and be sensitive to if you want to engage in this topic. All right, Dershowitz talks about only using torture against convicted terrorists. All right, that's, that's how he wants to frame it. Right? Ramsey's talking about terrorist suspects. Uh, right, not people not necessarily convicted of terrorism, but uh, you know people who are suspected of aiding and abetting or engaging in terrorist activity. And if you think about unthinkable, and I mentioned this last time, with Younger, right, Youssef, um, he's not convicted of anything. He's turned himself in and said, "Look, there, if we're in a ticking bomb situation, I planted these bombs, and they're going to go off unless you meet my demands." Um, he doesn't go through a trial. There's no judicial process there. Right, he's not arrested and read his rights and goes through a trial that's weeks or months long with evidence and arguments being broken. No, right? He's stuck in a room in some closed down school and they start torturing him real quick, try to get that information. So there's a real question there. Um, and th this is something Ramsey is getting to, but doesn't quite focus on directly, but I want to draw your attention to that Dershowitz is talking about only using torture against people convicted of, of terrorism, you know, convicted terrorists. Ramsey's talking about use of it against terrorist suspects. One of the other features of the war on terror and, and what was going on after it is with places like Abu Ghraib, Guantanamo Bay, and others, uh, people who were arrested and, you know, oh, you're a terrorist. Well, they didn't go through trial. They, they were not given access to normal legal processes. So there's an interesting question here, even if we wanted to use Dershowitz's approach, right? We're only gonna do it against convicted terrorists. What kind of trial could somebody suspected of terrorism, particularly in a ticking bomb situation, really expect to get, right? Imagine it was a condition that to torture younger Youssef and unthinkable, that he had to be convicted of terrorism first. Presumably there'd be a very quick show trial, right? Where they would sort of, behind closed doors, present evidence to a judge who would very, very quickly say, right, guilty of, you know, this, that, and the other thing, these terrorist offenses, now you're a terrorist, so here's your uh, torture warrant, go to it. Probably, right, just, just being realistic, you know, maybe not, but, uh, you know, imagine being the judge, and this is something Ramsey does draw attention to, imagine being the judge that refused to convict the, the terrorist suspect, or who denied the torture warrant, and then the ticking bomb really goes off. Um, think about the kind of pressures there, uh, professional, legal, moral, political, uh, uh, social, right? weighing on a judge in a situation where they have to you know, consider the issuing a torture warrant. Right? So there, there are these interesting questions, again, about who is it exactly we're talking about using torture against? Uh, Ramsey and Dershowitz have different approaches to this, so be sensitive to that. So looking at the academic debate, Ramsey notes that it really focuses on the ticking bomb scenario, this hypothetical ticking bomb scenario. Right? You've got a live device somewhere, it's on a timer, it's going to go off uh, with nobody's input or action, unless it's disarmed or diffused somehow, and the only way to be able to do that is to get the information about where it is and to do that in in the hypothetical scenario well you've got you know one or more suspects who it's believed to have information that will lead to this ticking bomb which you you know almost by definition can't be sure exists in the first place because you can't be there to check it out because you <laughs> if you could be then you'd already have the information you needed so in the hypothetical situation, there is this ticking bomb. You've got one or more terrorists, either guilty terrorists or terrorist suspects, who have information that could lead to it and, and allow it to be diffused or disarmed, thus saving innocent lives. Um, right? Do you use torture or not? Assuming that no other means of getting them to assist, you know, bribery, et, et cetera, are going to work. That's really how the academic debate had formulated. That's how Ramsey characterized it. Now, as she herself um, is going to point out by the end of the piece, 
that scenario itself, you know, limiting yourself to th talking about and thinking about that scenario itself is idealized and, and bizarre, right? You're really not engaging in a good faith debate about what really happens. Now, by focusing on this case, she, I think here, basically accurately describes Dershowitz's position, uh, that the argument begins with the assumption that an absolute ban on torture is practically and morally untenable, right? That an absolute ban that says we're never ever gonna use it, even in the unthinkable situation, uh, is just, it's, it's not gonna work, right? People aren't actually gonna do that, they're not gonna uphold it. Uh, and that even morally speaking, it's untenable, that um, you can't have an adequate moral theory that says you can never use torture, even if it's going to be to save millions of lives. We're gonna see what she says. So the ticking bomb scenario, this way of framing the issue, really suggests that the case for or against torture, the way we should think about it, is really consequential. It's the choice of evils approach that Dershowitz favors, right? And, and explicitly favors. Ramsey thinks that by setting up the debate around the ticking bomb situation, it does seem to favor the, the consequential approach, which she ultimately wants to reject. But before doing that, she go, uh, goes ahead and sort of looks at those consequential approaches and the differences within the people who um, do approach it that way, and then is ultimately gonna argue that that doesn't work. So there's really two main camps of theorists within the, the consequentialist pro approach, the non-institutionalized and institutionalized torture approaches. So uh, these are really, you know, the institutionalized torture camp, is really like the Dershowitz one. This should be part of the institutional legal structure of the country. This shouldn't be something done inside of the, the normal framework, behind closed doors, off the books, back room, shady stuff. So this is something that we should be open and honest about. The non-institutionalized camp or you know, the group are the ones that say, look, at least in certain situations, say the ticking bomb situation, the use of torture would be justified, morally justified, but we should keep it illegal for certain reasons. So that's, that's really the, the debate within the consequentialist approach. So the debate really hinges on whether or not legally integrating torture will have better or worse consequences than keeping the practice nominally illegal, that is illegal at least in name, with the caveat that successful instances of torture may be excused ex post. Uh, ex post means really based on the results or, or you know, after the fact. So Ramsey engages with this, um, you know, really, and, and this is, just thinking back to the Dershowitz piece, this is exactly what he was talking about. Uh, you know, what's, what's really better when we're thinking about the sorts of values a liberal democracy wants to uphold? Uh, you know, we want to minimize the use of torture. We don't want it running rampant. We want it to be used only in certain exceptional circumstances. We want to minimize uh, violations of human rights and erosion of civil liberties. We want open accountability in a democracy. We also want to protect the safety and security of citizens. And it's within that framework, Dershowitz wants to argue that institutionalizing torture within that legal framework is what strikes the best balance of those values. The people who argue for the non-institutional side really want to argue and they say, look, by, by making it part of the normal legal structure, we're going to normalize it to some extent, which is going to lead to wider spread use of torture than if we keep it illegal, but will allow uh, people, you know, if, if an agent, right, say H or Maya or, you know, whomever, if they use torture in a ticking bomb situation, not authorized by anybody else, but they looked at the situation, um, decided that the, the detainee or detainees that they had um, some kind of authority over, it was likely enough that they had information that would lead to the, the successful disarming of a ticking bomb kind of scenario, you know, the stopping of a plot somehow, the stopping of an attack, um, that it would be worth doing something illegal, namely torturing them, to get that information. That, you know, leaving it up to those individual agents or whatever we want to call them to make that kind of decision and take that kind of risk will help keep torture, or the use of torture, minimized. Okay? Uh, and of course, we could always excuse it, even if they did break the law by torturing. Um, we could always, you know, suspend the sentence if they got one or, you know, not bring them to trial, not lay charges, whatever it could be, right? Basically, keep it illegal, right? At least in name, 
but not actually prosecute and imprison people who successfully engage in torture and actually say stop a ticking bomb somehow. So this is really, um, I, sh I should have stuck up this last point, I'm sorry, this is really what I've been talking about here. Um, so the one group, you know, the Dershowitz group really, uh, claims legalizing torture will increase public accountability and, and ensure judicial oversight. Uh, so up, upholds those liberal democratic values and by including judicial oversight, make sure that torture is only used in, in the right sorts of circumstances. And the other group claims that by keeping it illegal, right, this is really going to uphold the moral and legal taboo on its use, even if in practice, we don't always prosecute people who have been engaged in torture. Now, so that's what the, you know, how the debate often runs, right, at least within the consequentialist sort of approach, there's still this division about, well, should it be legal or not, right? Because you can be a consequentialist to say, torture's okay, at least sometimes, but we should keep it illegal all the time, or no, we should actually make it legal. Ramsey points out that both of these uh, consequentialist approaches have shortcomings, right? They're, they're both problematic. So in either case, whether torturing is, is part of the legal system or not, what's really going to matter after the tortures actually happened and we're thinking about whether or not, um, you know, the tortures should be uh, held to account somehow, should they be charged, imprisoned, whatnot. What's really going to matter is how the torturers' actions seem, right? Did they seem justified or not to the others who are going to hold them accountable? Um, so it's not going to be a matter of, right, and, and in some sense it almost never is, it's not really a matter of, you know, uh, were they really justified based on the information they, they had at the time? But you know, do their actions seem justified to other people who are, in some sense, already on their side? Right. So if we think about Zero Dark Thirty or we think about Unthinkable, um, just sticking with that, that sort of context, what's going to matter is how the actions of American agents seemed to other Americans engaged in law enforcement right? or, or the legal system more generally. Uh, it's not like they're going to, and in fact, this is a, an interesting point, uh, you know, the Americans refuse to uh, sign up to, you know, the International um, uh, Criminal Court, right, and other international bodies that try to um, apply international treaties and, and things like that that govern the use of, of things like torture. And of course, even for countries that do sign up to those things, the efficacy of them uh, is, is questionable. And now I'm not saying they are inefficacious. I'm not saying that they're pointless or, right. That's not some kind of coded, oh yeah, they're terrible and stupid and they really have the right, right. What I'm saying is that there's an interesting debate there about who should be in charge of trying to hold people to account for actions like you know, torturing a terrorist suspect, right? Or, or violating a convention like that. Should it be the legal system of you know, the country of the people who are doing it? Should it be the legal system of the country that the actions were done against? Should it be some sort of international body? These are, are tricky questions. You know, what will produce the fairest justice, right? Or most, most impartial justice? A huge, interesting debate. I'm not gonna sit here and pretend to have these, you know, oh yeah, here's the answer, and that's really easy, and there's nothing to think about. No, there's, there's too much to think about. That's part of the problem, um, or part of the interesting thing. So, you know, it's, this this point that Ramsey has, it's really how the torturer's actions seem, right? That's really going to, to matter. Now, keeping torture legal, but potentially excusing its successful use, as she puts it, places disproportionate responsibility on the actual perpetrators of the illegal acts. So if we go with the, uh, you know, keep it illegal route, the non-institutionalized route, then that's really putting, um, this, this huge responsibility on the actual perpetrators of these illegal acts of torture. On the other hand, uh, Ramsey notes that by, if, if we instead made it legal, it would in some sense alleviate the moral responsibility uh, of the decision about whether or not to torture from the people who are actually doing it, right? If it went through a court system and it had to go through a judge, assuming the judge grants the warrant, um, it seems entirely plausible that just psychologically at least, the people who would actually be engaged in torture could then 
uh, just sort of absolve themselves of any kind of, of guilt or responsibility, right? Well, now I'm just doing my job, right? A judge issued the warrant. I didn't make the decision, you know, um, my team or me or, or maybe even some other person got the evidence, brought it before a judge, the judge deemed that was sufficient, right? It's all just part of the structure. It's all part of the system now. It's not me doing something wrong or potentially wrong. I'm just, I'm just doing my job, right? Um, and so Ramsey thinks that either of those approaches can be actually highly problematic in terms of the psychology of the decision-making procedure going on. Now, in addition, so um, thinking about, you know, how the actions of, of torturers are going to seem, um, the potential terrorist interests are probably not going to be weighted fairly, right? Uh, the suspected terrorists are typically seen as the others, right? The other, like, a dip, it's part of they, right? It's them, it's not us. Torturers, on the other hand, are one of us, protecting our interests, right? Doing the dirty work that we're not willing to do. Think unthinkable here. <laughs> I know that. Think unthinkable. Um, the torturers can provide misleading accounts of their evidence and reasoning, right? As Ramsey notes, law enforcement personnel already do on issues far less serious than whether or not to torture a ticking bomb terrorist, right? Um, so torture could still be kept off the books, right? In instances where the, the evidence was not sufficient to obtain a torture warrant, um, even in trying to get a torture warrant, misleading information could be uh, supplied as, she, you know, Ramsey puts it, applications like that could be sexed up, right? Made to look more appealing than they really are. Again, it's going to be this question of how, how things seem, right? Uh, and when you've got people handling evidence and, and creating narratives, well, that's, right, uh, allows for a considerable amount of spin. You know? um, and Ramsey also notes, based on the, the evidence she has, what she's looking through with you know, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that there's already a culture of impunity for military and law enforcement personnel more generally when they do things that they're not supposed to do. So she gives um, uh, um, example. So talking about Abu Ghraib, right? So this, this prison in Iraq where there was in some sense well-documented uh, torture of inmates or mistreatment of inmates, depending on how we want to categorize these things. Um, it was only a handful of enlisted troops that were ultimately punished. Ramsey uh, notes that not one U.S. agent has been charged with torture under U.S. law at the time of writing this in 2006, and in over 70% of official actions taken in response to substantiated allegations of abuse, those committing them have received non-judicial or administrative sentences. So in over 70% of official actions taken in response to allegation, uh, substantiated allegations of abuse, the people who were doing it had to like, you know, they had to go do paperwork or they got sort of demoted or, or something like that, right? They weren't held legally responsible, criminally responsible for say torturing somebody else when they weren't supposed to. So um, Ramsey thinks that given these facts, right? Um, this whole debate about whether or not the use of torture should be institutionalized or not, often just sort of papers over and ignores these facts, right? Um, and holds up a kind of idealized picture about how that process is going to work, how that legal process is going to work, uh, or how um, the, the political and, and military process is going to work in terms of holding people accountable for doing things that they, you know, you know, shouldn't do, but we're willing to excuse sometimes, right, if it produces good results, or, you know, well, we've got, you know, torture is, is legal, at least in certain circumstances, so it turns into a question of, well, was it legal under these particular circumstances or not? And that's where you're going to see um, this, this kind of, of twisting to try to make sure that instances of torture are put in the right category, right? Oh, they really were justified, right? On here, I think, I'm, I'm not going to spend time doing it, but I think you can draw some really interesting parallels to, um, you know, widespread and, and interesting discussions occurring right now about issues like um, police brutality, right, particularly against, uh, you know, people within minority groups, right, people of color and so on. Uh, law enforcement personnel, right, police officers are legally allowed 
under certain circumstances to use force, right? To stop a violent criminal. This, you know, uh, Dershowitz was talking about you know shooting a felon if they're trying to flee the scene of a crime or something, even before they've been convicted, right? Somebody suspected of committing a, a felony or a dangerous offense of some sort, right? Uh, and to some extent, I think we want this, right? If somebody's trying to kill you and the police show up to help you, you don't want it to be the case that they are not allowed to use force to stop somebody trying to kill you ever, right? I, I think that's fairly uncontroversial. Now, what do we really seem to have on our, our hand, right? What really seems to happen? I think there are interesting questions about exactly how widespread it is um, and you know, under exactly what conditions and so on. But there are, right, and I, I don't think anybody can seriously deny that there are instances where police or law enforcement personnel do use force when it's not justified. Right? There, there's at least one instance when it happens or, or has happened. Right? And anybody who's saying, oh no, never, right? Uh, there are instances where law enforcement personnel have been convicted of doing so i think it would be very idealized to say oh it never happens so it um so there's this question whenever say an officer uses force was it a justified use of force or not right if it was justified then they were doing their job they're doing the thing they're supposed to do they shouldn't be held accountable and so on but if it wasn't well now they've committed an illegal act now they're a criminal right Presumably, they should be held accountable. And some of those decisions about whether or not use, you know, force should be used can be tough, right? And I, I don't envy the officers and, and people in law enforcement and, and you know, people in the military who have to make those very tough decisions. I, I've, I, I get to make much easier decisions that right? uh, almost certainly aren't going to get anybody killed. So there are some really tough decisions to be made there. And there can certainly be borderline cases, right? Were they or weren't they really justified in that use of force? Did they do something illegal or were they doing their job? Apply that, right, that, that debate we already know happens um, and all of the, the sort of murkiness around it and, and the divisiveness and, and people saying, you know, look, no, um, it's, it's widespread abuse of power. They're, they're largely doing things they shouldn't be doing and, and need to be able to count people on their side saying, look, they're trying to do their best. They're, you know, in good faith, trying to carry out their jobs and protect people. And sometimes they make mistakes, but we shouldn't, you know, necessarily punish them too intently for mistakes. Now, I'm trying to do my best here not to take a side. I'm just characterizing this debate that we have that's, that's very much out in the public sphere. What Ramsey is pointing to here is that, especially if torture is allowed under any circumstances, you're going to have that very similar debate, and you're going to have people... Um, you know, sympathetic to the, the agents who actually engage in torture and that whole apparatus and, and what they're trying to do, often trying to say, look, even, right, even if really torture shouldn't have been used in that case, it didn't really meet the standards that are, are set for torture, the kind that Dershowitz wants. There's going to be a serious effort on behalf of at least certain people to sort of twist and characterize the, the events and the evidence, you know, what's going on, to make it seem like that torture was justified. And then, in fact, the people who are engaged in torture shouldn't be punished, even if it wasn't really justified at all. Okay. So after characterizing all this and pointing out the shortcomings for this whole approach to uh, the question of whether or not torture should ever be used, Ramsey uh, claims that a successful consequentialist case has to satisfy three criteria, which he says it won't do. First, that the general societal harm does not outweigh the particular benefits of legitimated torture, right? I, and, and look, uh, I think Dershowitz largely agrees with um, these three points as well. He just thinks these criteria can be met, Ramsey doesn't. So Ramsey um, thinks, when we're thinking about this first particular instance, we really have to think beyond the ticking bomb case. Right, of course we can try to just narrow ourselves and just talk about the ticking bomb case. But she thinks once we do that, um, there is a slippery slope, right? Uh, well, you know, look, and, and she herself characterizes it quite well. Uh, look, if we're willing to use it in the ticking bomb case, why not use it against people who would be willing to plant the ticking bomb? If uh, we're willing to use it against the person willing to plant the ticking bomb, what about the person who's willing to consider planting the ticking bomb? If we're willing to use it against somebody who's willing to consider it, 
why not use it against people who know something about the people who would consider planting the ticking bomb, right? And so on and so on. Uh, and she points to uh, different countries, right? Different, different places in the world, different security um, systems that do engage the use of torture as a, a kind of information gathering tool in sort of very general ways, justifying that, well, look, you never know when we're gonna find the information that could actually help us stop a ticking bomb. Never know who really knows what. So why not just sort of torture everybody uh, and see what turns up, right? And again, Zero Dark Thirty. It's really only because they have that detainee program and that they're torturing lots and lots of people, not in ticking bomb scenarios, but just to see what they know, that they have all this information that they can then use to try to, to corroborate um, certain pieces of information and, and fact check and so on. Second, the certainty that torture would be confined to exceptional cases which in many places it already is not, right? Uh, and, and so this is really, I, I should have saved that sort of slippery slope for here. Uh, and this is part of what that general societal harm really uh, ties into, right? Is, is the use of torture going to start to become widely legitimated? Mm -hmm. um, and, and just on this, um, oh, in my notes here, I've got what I was saying before. Uh, Ramsey reports that something like, um, you know, report that came out, something like 70 to 90% of prisoners in Iraq had been arrested by mistake. Um, and Ramsey also cites another report that something like, um, I have my notes here, 80 to 94% of Palestinians were subject to torture at, at some point. Um, I've got page 113 to 14 written down there, so it might be worth checking into. I'm wondering if I maybe made a little typo there, but maybe not. Okay, so, uh, there's a real slippery slope that needs to be contended with. Uh, and then, of course, the third point, you know, uh, if torture actually works. It produces reliable information that cannot be gathered by other means. And here, Ramsey cites a declassified FBI memo uh, from an official in Guantanamo Bay that states, uh, extreme coercion produced nothing more than the FBI got by using simple interrogation techniques. So they really weren't getting anything more or, or better in terms of information. They would have gotten just the standard techniques. Um, and there, there is, a, I think, a very interesting question here about um, to what degree does torture work, you know, if ever. And Dershowitz admits, look, it, it's, you know, not going to always work, but it might work at least some of the time. And so if it's going to work at least some of the time, if we're in a, you know, say, ticking bomb scenario, then why not use it then, right? Only in those exceptional circumstances. Part of what Ramsey is really trying to point out here is that as soon as we're willing to entertain using it in those exceptional circumstances, well, we've opened the door, right? The slippery slope is, is real. Uh, as soon as you're willing to use it, you know, just in this one little situation, well, why not one that's just, just a little bit more removed from that? Why not the next one from that, right? You know, if we could save 10 million lives, maybe, you know, torture would be justified. But what if it's 9 million? What if it's 8 million? What if it's 7, 6, 5, 4, right? What if it's a thousand lives? What if it's 500, 50, 20, 10, 2, 1? Right? What's our probability, right? Our, own, our assessment of the probability, right? Um, this comes up in unthinkable, right? Even if it's only a 1% chance the bombs are real, well, we've got to do everything in our power to, to stop them, right? But there's always at least a 1% chance there's, you know, bombs planted somewhere. Okay, maybe not 1%. That's, that's probably too high, right? But there's a chance, right? Any given day, there could be bombs planted somewhere. Don't really know for sure that they're not, right? Um, so is it only when we're, you know, 1% sure that there's, the bombs might be real? Is it 90%, 50%, right? Any line we draw, we can like, well, why not just a little bit this side or that side, right? Why not loosen it up just a little bit? So Ramsey thinks the consequentialist approaches uh, cannot satisfy these criteria ultimately. Uh, they, it does more general societal harm than it, it produces benefits, right? Torture is not going to be confined to exceptional cases, and torture just does not work, right? Just, just in general, it's just not effective. Okay, so coming around to the last part, Ramsey putting forward her own view, she thinks that this whole consequentialist approach, so both the institutionalized and non-institutionalized groups, are really approaching this the wrong way to start with. Torture is morally wrong in all circumstances, 
and can't be justified even by successful results, Ramsey holds. And why is it wrong? And this is where she um, makes use of another uh, um, highly influential moral theory or, or moral approach. So there's the consequentialism of the utilitarians like Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill that say, you know, it's really the results that matter, it's the consequences that matter, and we're trying to determine whether or not something's morally right or wrong. On the other hand, there is the uh, Immanuel Kant, 18th century uh, German philosopher, who developed a, another moral system, which is typically called the deontological approach to morality. It's based on duties, and it really focuses on acts themselves. So it's not the results of the acts that matter in determining whether or not they're right or wrong, but rather it's the act itself. So for instance, if we're thinking about, say, lying, you know, can, can lying to somebody be the right thing to do? Kant would say no, because lying itself is wrong. It doesn't matter what the consequences are. The consequences you can't control are just a separate, a separate thing, right? Uh, consequences be what they may. You do the right thing by doing the right action, which means you, you do the thing that has the right reasons behind it. Uh, if you've got the right motives, well, which is really about doing the things you know that are right, irrespective of their consequences, like telling the truth. People like Bentham and Mill, the, the consequentialists, Sort of depends on exactly how the consequentialist wants to approach the matter, but they'd probably be willing to say something like, at least in certain circumstances, it's okay to lie because you increase happiness or, uh, you know, somehow or other make a better state of, of affairs, you have better results from lying than not. Right? So Ramsey herself really is taking the Kantian view here. So she says, what is inherently wrong with torture is captured by the Kantian idea that torture violates physical and mental integrity and negates autonomy, humanity, and dignity, coercing the victim to act, act against their most fundamental beliefs, values, and interests. Um, she goes on, she says, torture involves a systematic mockery of the moral relations between people. It is, it, it is a deliberate perversion of the value of dignity and an insult to agency. Agency is turned on itself. The torturer forces the victim into a position of colluding against himself, so he experiences himself as simultaneously powerless, a passive victim, yet actively complicit in his own debasement. Torture is not just an extreme form of cruelty, but an instance of forced self-betrayal where the torturer pits the victim against himself as an active participant in his own violation. So torture is wrong in itself. Why? Precisely because it takes away uh, the, the dignity of the person being tortured takes away their autonomy, their capacity to choose what they want to do, to act on their own beliefs, uh, to make their own decisions, uh, and really um, puts the, the torturer in a position of complete domination and control over the person being tortured, which really transforms the person being tortured from what we consider a person, a, a human, a, a being worthy of, of dignity and respect, uh, a bearer of rights into a mere thing, right? Into an object to be manipulated uh, until it produces the desired results. So Ramsey goes ahead and, and closes with a suggestion, right? So she's articulated uh, a, a different moral approach, one that thinks torture is wrong in and of itself. Here you can think, right, Agent Brody is giving voice to that view, at least in, in parts of Unthinkable. You know, most of it, she does sort of maybe slip a little bit here and there. Um, but Ramsey tries to give a suggestion. So if, if torture is really always wrong, why is it used? Why is it used, you know, at times in such a widespread fashion, so the injury war and terror and so on? Well, you know, especially if it doesn't really work, right, as she asserts, it, it doesn't really produce reliable information that you can get other ways. So why use it at all? Well, it's not for getting information, rather it's as a method of total domination and societal control. So Ramsey has asserted right, that the widespread use of torture doesn't result in better intelligence that can be gathered by other means. So instead, torture is used as an instrument to manipulate communities, right? to morally manipulate communities, you know, to move in uh, and to take people and torture them. That's really the the act of a dictator, like I mentioned, you know, um, Hussein, right? Hussein's dictatorial regime used Abu Ghraib as a prison, right? Um, 
torture is often used by dictators and tyrants as a way of, of you know, beating communities into submission, making people do what you want them to do, whether or not that's what they want, right? It's a way of, of dominating, of um, controlling, not a way of uh, you know, successfully listening information. And what Ramsey notes here, and this again is debatable, you know, what are the root causes of terrorism? Why, why does that happen at all? Well, part of what Ramsey um, points to in the piece, and, and perhaps doesn't sort of fully support, but I think there's at least some intuitive plausibility there, something we followed up on later. So here's another area where you know, stipulating assumptions comes in handy if you want to write on this. Um, but using torture as an instrument to enforce you know, the will of a particular country or foreign policy or whatever, uh, that's, that's probably a way to actually promote terrorism, right? Just like flip it around, right? Imagine Canada was invaded by, I don't know, Russia or, or you know, pick, pick wherever you want, right? Um, right? Russia or China or the United States or, um, you know, what, Turkey or what have you. And then imagine that whoever the occupying power was started using torture you know, like the widespread use of torture against the Canadian population really is a kind of, of tool, you know, they're gathering information, even though a lot of the people they're torturing don't really know anything, they're, they're not getting information that really couldn't get any other way. It would be hard to see that as anything other than a way of just trying to, you know, dominate and control the society. And it, you know, I think there is, is some plausibility to the suggestion that it would actually encourage something like terrorism and resistance. Right. I don't know about you, but if some other country occupied Canada and then agents from that other country came and tortured me when I didn't really know anything, that would probably get me pretty riled up. I highly doubt I would have a positive attitude towards them. I think I would probably be um, more sympathetic to things like terrorist acts against them than I would have been before I was tortured. Right. So Ramsey thinks ultimately using torture. Um, Right, in, in this sort of way, right, this uh, kind of domination and control, it's really gonna have counterproductive consequences because when torture is used to, even as a method of intelligence gathering, the line starts to blur between liberal democracies standing for human rights, individual freedoms, and the freedom for communities to be self-determining, and tyrannical governments not committed to their values, or to those values. Right? And so Ramsey, you know, conclude, she says, the conclusion of this article is that we need to reaffirm the absolute prohibition on torture in all circumstances without exception, and to reaffirm the most basic of all principles, respect for human dignity. Now, she thinks that this stance, right, the one she's taking out, could be criticized as being utopian, naive, and irresponsible. But she argues that it's those who approach the issue of torture through the ticking bomb scenario, right, the, the several different authors she cites, including Dershowitz, who want to frame the debate around that, right? Let's take the ticking bomb situation. We'll use that as, as our uh, scenario to think about whether or not torture could be used. It's people who do that who are utop utopian, naive, and irresponsible, she thinks, right? She says, it is utopian, naive, and irresponsible to assume that a defense of limited torture in a hypothetical ideal situation of imminent catastrophe, perfect knowledge, and accurate cost-benefit analysis will not migrate to and be distorted in actual judicial or policy or individual interrogators' decisions in less ideal, less calculable circumstances. It helps perpetuate the illusion that the success in fighting the war on terror is dependent on the quality of intelligence and is not dependent on political action or the foreign policy of Western governments. In doing so, it diverts attention away from the conditions in which the perceived need for torture arises and which themselves are in need of moral scrutiny and rectification. Given this, it would be less utopian, more realistic, and responsible to change those aspects of international relations that ferment terrorism in the situations in which the need for torture arises, rather than accepting the inevitability of torture in some circumstances and trying to find the criteria to justify its use. So, as we see from Ramsey's piece, uh, there are you know, at least a couple of different ways to approach this topic, right? Uh, one, one of the differences between Ramsey and Dershowitz concerns what sorts of facts they're willing to consider. So Dershowitz wants to stick with the fairly narrow ticking bomb situation. Ramsey says, you, right, 
that's a way of sort of falsely limiting what you want to talk about. We have to think this in a much, but think about this in a much larger context, right? The context of international relations, uh, what repercussions different sorts of actions have, being realistic about, you know, can we keep the use of torture um, limited to only certain situations, right? Even if it did work to some degree, uh, and, and we used it in the ticking bomb situation, why not a situation that could lead to a ticking bomb situation, and so on. Uh, as a matter of fact, there is a culture of impunity against the you know, military and, and law enforcement personnel who do things they're not supposed to. So if we allow for any kind of use of torture, right, whether, whether it's part of the legal system or not, if we're willing to condone and, and accept the use of it at any point, um, it, it seems in some sense naive and idealistic to think that there are not gonna be instances where it gets used uh, and the people who use it aren't punished when they should be. And in fact, that might just help promote its more widespread use. And in fact, the reason it does get used quite often, Ramsey maintains, is really as a, a means of domination and control, not as a means of intelligence gathering, even if it can be used as a means of intelligence gathering. Um, it, it's often used for more nefarious purposes, something that gives expression to the darker side of human nature, uh, which, you know, allowing and condoning its use in a liberal democracy, which is supposed to stand for, you know, the, sort of the ideals of, of what it is to be morally good humans, um, is going to lend at least tacit uh, support for the use of it by tyrants and dictators. So it's, it's a difficult topic. It's an interesting topic, I think. Uh, and I think both Unthinkable and Zero Dark Thirty give us a different approach to it. Unthinkable tries to stick it in that little box, puts it in the ticking bomb scenario, which I think is still useful, right? A ticking bomb scenario, well, in, in some sense, unlikely to happen. It's not impossible, right? So it certainly could happen. It may have already happened, right? Probably not. I think maybe we would have heard of it, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Right? So ticking bomb scenarios can happen. But then again, we also do live in a world where you know, uh, uh, foreign policy is, is something that is ongoing, what countries and individuals do, what sorts of tactics they employ, there's a memory for these things. So you, you know, just think about the, I, I don't know whether to say it's hundreds or thousands of uh, people in you know, Afghanistan and, and Iraq who have likely been tortured or and have enhanced interrogations or whatever we want to call them. Uh, at the hands of American or other troops, right? Uh, you know, agents from other countries as well, and not saying, "Oh, it's just America." Um, I highly doubt they've forgotten, right? They just sort of shrug their shoulders and say, "Oh, well, you know, things happen." That time, I, the, you know, uh, they put me naked in the pyramid and put the dog collar on me and kept me up for seventy-two hours playing Metallica at you know extreme volumes when I was. Uh, stuck in 120 degree heat out in the sun, and you know they pulled out my fingernails, and right, oh shoot, it was just a big misunderstanding. I don't think that would be my attitude, and so I certainly don't blame anybody else who would take up that attitude. Right? So that is something important and relevant in our considerations as well. What are the long term consequences of using something like torture? Right? Okay, I could probably sit here and keep sort of spinning my wheels and, and going back over this but I'll go ahead and wrap it up. So there's Ramsey's piece on the use of torture. I think a very nice counterbalance to Dershowitz's piece. Um, Dershowitz, he's got a pretty good argument, right? It, it looks pretty convincing when you, you first look at it. Ramsey's got a pretty good argument too, which is part of what makes it such an interesting debate to examine. So that's all for today. I'll be back next time talking about Elysium and the global distribution of wealth. Until then, I hope you're doing well. Hope you've enjoyed the, the video lecture and you'll see me again tomorrow. Till then, bye for